Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Jan Iftimi, this guy over here. Um, I'm the Eisenhower Fellow at the NATO Defense College. Uh, my research uh, has to do uh, with uh, energy security and cybersecurity for, uh, for NATO. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Department of Defense energy security here in, in, in the U.S. Um, and also kind of bring in the, the cyber and the, the, the climate uh, elements within uh, DOD uh, policies. So a little bit about my background. I'm prior military. Um, so uh, spent about 15 years in the, in the Army, started as a uh, uh, special operations uh, officer, and my job was uh, primarily to uh, right, know how to destroy critical infrastructure. And then I switched from there into the cyber realm where I had to all of a sudden uh, had the task to help protect critical infrastructure uh, in the U.S. And then from there, over the past uh, couple of years, I've been working, uh, trying to promote that uh, within, uh, within NATO. So uh, this is also uh, related to the topic of my, uh, my PhD. I'm a doctoral candidate. I'm supposed to finish in about six months if I'm lucky enough that they, uh, they accept my dissertation. Uh, so uh, this has been a pain for me for, uh, for a couple of years now. So bear with me. So let's see. Which, uh, which one do I press for? Okay, there you go. So the agenda for today's presentation, um, I'm gonna look at uh, right, what, what is DOD concerned about when it talks about uh, energy security and cybersecurity, uh, so what to protect, uh, from what threats to protect, uh, by what means, uh, and then we're gonna have a discussion where you know, we'll do questions and answers. So what, why am I talking about uh, energy security within the context of cybersecurity and the environment? So this is uh, from the World Economic Forum uh, report in uh, 2019, uh, where they have this uh, really neat graph about, uh, uh, you know, likelihood versus impact. Uh, of different threats that uh, imp impact the global economy. Uh, and if you see at the, one of the top for both likelihood and impact is, uh, is climate change. So you have to, you have to consider the environment in, in, in everything that you do. Um, the other thing for, for high likelihood that is uh, uh, highlighted as number five is, uh, is cyber attacks, and that's also number seven on, on high impact. So, so cyber attacks are expected to have a very significant impact and the likelihood is very high um, over the next uh, few years. And then the other aspect that comes in, in, uh, when, when you talk about energy security is this uh, critical information infrastructure uh, breakdown. So uh, particularly with militaries, they're dependent on fuel to operate. Uh, well, if that uh, infrastructure that uh, delivers a fuel to them breaks down for whatever reason, whether it's uh, uh, a cyber attack or, or right, a, a big even weather event that uh, impacts uh, that fuel reaching the target that can impact uh, military operations. So a lot of times when, when you talk about uh, the U.S., U.S., particularly the Department of Defense, had uh, in the previous administration was really very focused on bringing sustainability within military operations. So you have the establishment of the Green Fleet uh, within the, the U.S. military and a lot of different other uh, efforts in, in that realm. When we talk about the, the current administration and, and uh, right, the, impact, the, the, the focus on the environment, everybody starts talking about uh, the Paris Agreement. Oh, uh, President Trump, uh, you know, got out of the Paris Agreement, that means uh, the U.S. doesn't really care about the environment. And that's not necessarily true, right? So it's, it's just a change in focus. Uh, it just means that uh, a lot of times when it comes to definitions of energy security, uh, the focus was much more on real reliability than sustainability. But that doesn't mean because the, the focus has changed, it doesn't mean that uh, that the environment is less important uh, for the Department of Defense. 
So why should the Department of Defense care when, when you're talking about uh, sustainability? Um, well, the Department of Defense is the largest uh, energy consumer in America. Uh, so when you're talking about uh, environmental prog uh, programs uh, and, and promoting environmental programs within the country, right, the government has a responsibility to, to live up by example. And with DOD uh, being the, the highest uh, right, consumer of oil within the federal government, has a responsibility to go ahead and adopt some of these sustainable programs. Uh, and the other part is the um, Department of Defense has been unable to decrease its fuel consumption for the past six years. And, and this is primarily because the Department of Defense operations are dependent on fuel that is closest to where the operation takes place, right? So if you have operations in the Middle East, you will see that the Department of Defense will, will buy and purchase a lot of the fuel that is needed to sustain these operations in the Middle East from the Middle East. And this is, uh, and over the past six years, consumption has, has pretty much stayed the same, which means that, you know, we haven't made much progress to, uh, uh, to bring in more sustainable uh, efforts and technologies that would decrease the consumption of fuels and, and make us more sustainable and environmentally friendly within the, uh, within the, the U.S. military. And this is despite the fact that the, the Green Fleet is still very much operational. All right, so we're going to move into, into uh, what, uh, what to protect. Um, and, and I'm going to run through some of my challenges uh, working with different governments within NATO member states, um, particularly when trying to bring together the issue of energy security, uh, cybersecurity, and environmental security um, together. Like, there's usually different departments that tackle these issues, and they, they don't really talk much. They don't have much interact or as, as much interaction as they should be. And you will see that in the definition of energy security, cyber doesn't really come up, uh, nor does uh, in, uh, the environmental or the sustainable issue. Um, so. On, on the definition of energy security and resilience for Department of Defense, uh, these were changed, and this is where you see a, a shift in focus uh, of what energy security really is. Um, sustainability was, was a big push and part of energy security, right? So, but with them, with, with the Defense Authorization Act of uh, 2018, uh, redefining energy security as having a short access to reliable supplies of energy and the ability to protect, deliver sufficient energy to meet mission essential requirements. So this is a very pragmatic view of, of energy security. It's very much in line with what uh, uh, International Energy uh, Agency uses to define energy security uh, without necessarily focus on the aspect of sustainability. And uh, another issue when talking about uh, the environment, uh, you always say, well, you, you, you don't have to talk about energy security if they don't define it that way. Just use energy resiliency, because then you can uh, justify that the environment, uh, the environment piece within the resiliency aspect of it. Well, the same act also defines energy resilience as the ability to avoid, prepare for, minimize, adapt to, and recover from anticipated unanticipated energy disruptions in order to ensure energy availability and reliability sufficient to provide for mission assurance and readiness, including task critical assets and other mission essential operations related to readiness and to execute or rapidly establishing mission essential requirements. Sustainability is nowhere on the definition. So even if you talk about resilience uh, within, uh, within the DOD uh, definitions, um, sustainability doesn't come up. Right. So uh, when you talk about cyberspace on the other side, um, uh, the focus is primarily on software and, and hardware. And this is, kind of, this is coming from the, from the Department of Defense uh, doctrine of how they look at, uh, at cyber, where they have a physical layer um, that, uh, that they have to defend, uh, the logical layer and the social layer. Um, typically, they would look at this 
within the construct of uh, Department of Defense infrastructure. Well, events have happened in, 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 pre in recent years where Department of Defense infrastructure is also very much reliant on civilian infrastructure. So if certain civilian infrastructure goes down, it also affects military infrastructure. So as a result, the cyber mission for, um, for the Department of Defense has changed where it actually includes uh, the protection of uh, civilian critical infrastructure. So where over here, when you talk about physical network components, uh, the focus may have been, okay, well, we don't want our computers being hacked into, right? Now all of a sudden you have DOD looking at, well, we have to protect pipelines. We have to protect the grid. We have to look at climate maybe. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if, if, a certain attack, uh, say for example, against a, uh, uh, a Navy ship, uh, causes that Navy ship to hit a rig, just out of, right? And uh, because ships tend to be very less secure on the cyber side, and causes an environmental uh, disaster, could you say that, okay, well, you know, the US has to make sure that, uh, you know, or protect certain pumps in a pipeline from exploding so that uh, a leak doesn't actually happen. So things are changing where now the Department of Defense uh, cyberspace operation missions include uh, not only the secure operate and defend Department of Defense network missions and systems, which is typically how it used to be in the past. It also includes defending the nas uh, nation from cyber attacks of significant consequence. So, but what, what really does mean significant consequence? Um, so this is, uh, how the U.S. defines the critical infrastructure in the United States, right? So you have the energy, which is, uh, what my focus is, but you can't just focus on energy, right? Because you know, I have energy in this particular case, dams are separated, I mean, they're connected, and you have nuclear. Uh, but then you have water, communications, transportation, chemical, commercial facilities, critical manufacturing, defense industrial, uh, emergency services, financial services, food and agriculture, government facilities, healthcare and public health, and information technology. But if you look at it, almost everything is connected to energy. And there's a, lot of, there, there's, there's a lot of interconnections, really. So when you look at, at energy security, for example, or, or you look at, at nuclear facility, right? You also have to look at uh, emergency services. You also have to look at uh, water, right? I mean, water is needed to, to cool down reactors. And so there's, there's, you have to look at second and third level effects when you look at, at, at uh, at the critical infrastructure that you're focusing on, on protecting. So when I look at energy, then I also have to consider, uh, right, government facilities. I also have to consider uh, emergency, uh, defense industrial, uh, commercial facilities, and even chemical, right? Because now you've got uh, the oil has to be refined and it gets refined to certain chemical facilities. So I'm also interested in this piece over here. Uh, and there's also transportation. Right? Fuel has to be transported, and uh, uh, whether natural gas, whether it's being transported by pipeline or whether it's being transported by LNG ships, uh, then you also look at the transportation uh, for it. So it becomes a little bit, you know, it kind of becomes like, you can see how it becomes like a small beast, that now Department of Defense, when they're looking at energy security, they have to look, uh, especially in the, in, within the context of cybersecurity, uh, beyond just, uh, you know, hey, are we gonna have uh, power tomorrow uh, at, uh, within a base? And then if, uh, and I'll cover an example later on, if there is a, a local uh, attack against the grid locally, how does that affect the operations for a local uh, uh, base, military base? So this is an example um, of, uh, of a potential threat that uh, happened in uh, 2017. Now, luckily, this was uh, just used for collection. Um, the Department of uh, Homeland Security and FBI have, have released a, a joint report uh, on this that is unclassified. 
uh, where you know Russia has actually uh, got in and, and tried to collect and, and try to identify vulnerabilities within a, uh, a nuclear uh, station in uh, in Kansas. And so, if you look at this, I mean, a lot of agencies when this when this happened have you know were were working together, and there was a lot of uh, I think this was still early on when the U.S. was trying to figure it out. Uh, how was the role of the Department of Defense in protecting uh, critical infrastructure on the civilian side? And this is operated by a private company, right? And if, if, if you're familiar with how protection of, of energy security happens within the U.S., it's, it's very much done at the state level. So now you have the federal government having to, to react, but within the Department of Defense, only the National Guard had access to the information. So now you have uh, the federal government like US Cybercom or, right, there's like, okay, well, we need to access to the information right now. Oh, National Guard has access. You call the general over there, it's like, hey, can, can we get access to this data? Well, we need the, the governor's signature because the National Guard falls under the, the, the state governor. It doesn't fall under the federal government. So now you've got, you, you run through all these bureaucratic hoops um, where it, it when this has happened at the, at the time, it caught us a little bit unprepared. Right? Now, luckily, this wasn't a, an attack that was meant to create damage. Right? But we learned a lot from it, and it prepared us in the case there is an event that hits us to, to, to create damage, um, that we can, uh, we can react to it. So kind of go through these bureaucratic hoops so that in the future we're prepared for an actual attack when it happens. But if you look at this, I mean, is this, okay, so a cyber attack against the energy infrastructure, right? So you talk about energy security. You talk about cyber security because it's a cyber attack. But you also talk environment, right? I mean, what's the effect, for example, of a nuclear meltdown? I mean, it will have an effect on the environment. Now, granted, a cyber attack to, to create a nuclear meltdown, I mean, that, that would have to be, right, some significant accesses to to create that, but I mean, that's almost happened, right? You've got, it's happened in, a, in the past against, right, where uh, certain technologies have attacked Iranian infrastructure. So it's possible, and then if a nuclear uh, meltdown actually happens, then you also have to think about, right, uh, so this, this is a, it's not a, uh, it's, it's an artificial lake. Nevertheless, it's a lake, and it has a lot of life and bio, bio right, there's a, a lot of life within that lake. They have, uh, I think it's the catfish competition that uh, is happening in that lake too. So, I mean, that would have been, you know, if you don't care about the environment, at least care about fishing and, you know, and that would have gone forever if, uh, uh, if, that, uh, if that water would have been polluted. I mean, all life on it would have died. So, right. And it, it's, you know, attacks against uh, generators and, and uh, Critical energy infrastructure is not a myth. It's real as, as all the way back to 2007. This is uh, the Idaho uh, National Laboratory. Uh, did an experiment with, uh, uh, on the Aurora generator. Uh, if you just Google 2007 Aurora and uh, Idaho National Laboratory, you'll see a video of it where it basically it just broke the generator just, just with cyber. So it's the the threat is is very much real and it, it expands is not just in the in the realm of the grid which is what we see in the news today um, with with and you know in the case of a of a nuclear facility right you could create a meltdown and you have an ecological disaster uh, kind of like how you've seen in uh, in japan so I put here the, the Queensland sewage uh, release of, of 2000, just because uh, even though this wasn't uh, an energy infrastructure, um, but this was uh, a sewage facility, uh, and a disgruntled employee gets fired in, in, uh, in Australia, um, goes ahead and uh, uh, hacks into their system and causes a whole lot of sewage being dumped into the local rivers and, you know, like huge ecological disaster. Um, at least at the local area, right? So we're not talking. Um, it has an environmental impact. So, yeah. Oh, you, um, yeah, let me finish and then I'll take questions because I'll have enough time for questions. So, but go, go ahead if you, what, what was your? Oh, 
Um, well, at least the employee was ended, ended up going to jail. So, but that's a good. That's a very good question. I mean, I know it's it's recovering. I mean, at least the smell is not there. But I mean, there were there were you know at least over a year that where the smell was really really bad. I mean, you've had the entire sewage being dumped into right. So, and there were people living there and. Uh, so at least at the local level, it, it created, uh, it had, oh, it was impacted at least locally, yeah. So, so this is one of the arguments that, that we're bringing in some of our research is that uh, DOD's energy security and resilience is currently limited by operational dependence on fossil fuels and cyber vulnerabilities of uh, uh, fuel transport infrastructure. Um, and I, I taught this, uh, this class in Estonia at their, um, uh, they've got uh, the defense, uh, one of the defense uh, colleges over there, like the Baltic Defense College. Uh, and I had all these colonels in the room and they had like a military operation and how to react to uh, a potential invasion uh, from one of their neighbors, right? And uh, they had the plan laid out and uh, all what we did is like, okay, well this, particular nodes, energy nodes, were targeted, and all of a sudden they didn't have fuel. So they didn't have fuel, they couldn't move their tanks. They couldn't, so uh, like they could see how their plan uh, on the reaction side was affected by just an attack on, on energy, a cyber attack on energy infrastructure. So, and I've, I've also had the opportunity of talking to uh, utilities uh, companies on the private side and refineries uh, in uh, one, particularly in uh, in Lithuania, that controls all the um, refin refined uh, fuels in in the Baltics. And as we were going through, we were looking there for energy security. We realized it's like, okay, well, they don't have a cyber division. And we actually asked the CEO, I was like, well, you don't have a." Uh, you know, do you have a cyber division? We, maybe we just didn't see it here. Maybe you have it hidden somewhere else. And because that's kind of, because you know, it's all like very sensitive information. And it's like, oh no, we don't have one. We don't need one. It's like, how do you know? We've never been hacked. It's like, how do you know you've never been hacked? Right? Because their idea of being hacked is kind of this. This is a picture from what happened in Ukraine. And this, this is actually on the internet. Somebody actually filmed it when it was happening, which is, which is, right? So all of a sudden, they see this mouse moving on the screen, and he was shutting down systems on the screen. And you could hear them uh, talking to each other. They thought it was somebody in the IT department doing some tests. They didn't even know they were being hacked. Right, so this is, when somebody talks about, about cybersecurity, and this is where you talk, when we talk to all these utilities companies, they're, they're thinking, oh, you, you know, we didn't have a, a big impact thing. But most of the cybersecurity vulnerabilities that are happening is somebody actually scanning your system for vulnerabilities so that it, when they need to attack you, they know where, where to attack you, right? And you, never, you can never notice that this has happened. And this is quite happen I mean, it's quite common. I mean, it's like even you look at the Yahoo, uh, a lot of the breaches that are happening, they find out like four years afterwards that they were hacked. Same with LinkedIn, I mean, four or five years after. It's like, oh, we were hacked five years ago. So in the energy field, a lot of the times, it's not necessarily that they're trying to, to create, a, a, particularly if there's a threat from a state, uh, a state actor, it's not so much that they're trying to hurt you right now, it's they're trying to position so that they can hurt you when they need to. And that's something to, to, uh, to keep in mind. Right, and this is, we've had several projects with, uh, with utilities in, uh, in, in Europe. And I won't mention particular countries, because, but it's kind of everywhere anyways. But um, most of our substations are very vulnerable. I mean, we're doing better here in the US, uh, but throughout the world, a lot of the substation technologies were not built with security in mind. They were built in order to function reliable, right, reliably, efficiently, but not necessarily with security systems uh, in place. 
So now you have, you know, even though you may have in, in a central station a lot of security uh, things in place, then you can access a lot of these central systems through a, uh, uh, through a substation, which oftentimes you, you drive by the highway or whatever and you see them like this with no, you know, no locks, no, uh, no video cameras to see, right, where what's, um, and you can just go in there and just mess with them and nobody's gonna say anything because they think if you pretend that you're, you put a hat on your head and just pretend that you work there, nobody's gonna say anything. So you could be installing whatever, and I'm not trying to give anybody ideas, but, um, but that's a threat, right? And then we were talking to a lot of the, 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 with the particular utility companies, like, okay, well, we have, we've identified this threat with all these stations, substations, that it's not enough to change some things in a substation. The whole substations had to be changed. Like, they had to install brand new substations. So we talked about costs, and they were like, okay, well, this is not sustainable. How long is it gonna take you to fix this particular vulnerability? About 10 years. So now you're talking by the time they fix this vulnerability, other vulnerabilities will, will, will show up in whatever system they're gonna try to replace this with. So it's, it's a big challenge, um, and it's a big challenge uh, for Department of Defense as well, because now you're talking, we know so certain vulnerabilities are out there, but now you're telling the private industry, for example, sometimes that there's a, there's, a, there's a vulnerability out there, but you also have to understand their challenges, right? Because, well, in order to fix some of these, they have to increase your, your bill. And then, well, if, how many people are happy with having their bill increased? So that's... And then you're going into, right, the whole redefinition of, of, of cyber where we're used to, right, everything, all, all computers used to be connected to uh, each other over the internet, but now you have ways of accessing computers remotely without even ever them, them ever being connected to, um, to the internet. So with that in mind, now you have, for example, the, the nuclear infrastructure uh, for a lot of the nuclear facilities that they're saying, oh, we're, we're protected because our, our, um, our computers for, that are operating this, uh, these systems are not connected to the internet. Well, they don't necessarily have to be. So now you have to consider other types of threats as well um, when it comes to cybersecurity. And then you've got the, the threat vectors, right? Who's, uh, wh what are we trying to protect ourselves from, right? So it's not just state actors. I mean, you look on, on the internet, this is, this is an example on the dark net. I mean, I think, you know, I don't think this guy's very smart, but um, he's trying to advertise that he can do illegal hacking. I mean, not just, you know, he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't just do the, the, the little things where, uh, you know, trying to, uh, uh, he's like, he's got over 20 years of, of you know, experience with it, and, uh, uh, but he's interested on the illegal side, so you can, you know, buy his services. And uh, if you look at his services, I mean, they're not that expensive. I mean, it's like 900 euros to, to do what? Like, uh, uh, for more complex uh, uh, jobs. If you wanna just do uh, es like uh, espionage for like corporate espionage, which uh, uh, it's illegal here in the US, but it's not illegal in all countries. So there's countries out there that actually, uh, that where companies actually get involved in, in uh, uh, corporate espionage. So you know, somebody that wants to like uh, break into your systems and uh, find out things and it's like only 500 euros. So not saying that this guy was qualified, but, but, but he was advertising that. So that's, I thought that was kind of funny that we look at it. But this, so there's different type of uh, uh, threats out there. I grew up in Romania. I came to the US when I was 17 years old. Um, so, before joining the military and before uh, eventually I worked with uh, Cybercom and um, I used to be one of these guys here, probably a script, script kitty, that's kind of how I, I started, where I wasn't necessarily writing code, but I was just, uh, before I started writing my own codes, like I would uh, try to find out tools, and this is back in the 90s, uh, just to hack for fun. I mean, I didn't know that maybe certain 
groups that would teach me, hey, let's, let's do this together on this particular tool. There could be an actual orchestrated attack um, against that. So you've got those guys, you've got the hackers, which everybody talks about, everybody talks about the hackers. Um, you got organized crime, this is really huge. Um, luckily, they're not so interested in, in attacking uh, critical uh, infrastructure. Uh, terrorists, which are a real threat when it comes to critical infrastructure, uh, but not so smart, luckily. Um, but they could get smarter, and if they get smarter, then you know we're in, we're in, we're in big trouble. Uh, there's the echo terrorists. I mean, you've got some smarter people coming over here because and hacktivists, right? Because they, those are people that uh, have a lot of know-how, uh, and they have a really big passion uh, for uh, for the environment and so forth. So you can have some more threats coming up. Uh, to energy infrastructure from eco terrorists in, in the future. Um, nation states who are already there, they're already a threat, they're already in our systems. Uh, and uh, is the challenge of, right, how do you take them out and how do you make their, their tools uh, less, uh, less capable, so to speak. And you got the cyber mercenaries, uh, those people that just do it like the guy was doing it, hey, I'm gonna sell my, my capabilities to whoever can pay me. Um, this is an old report, but it's so much, so much still true, right? So it's like when I was hacking, it was back in, uh, right, uh, 1996, 1998, um, right? It was like very basic uh, type of uh, capabilities. Um, but now, so, so not so much a threat, not a lot of the systems were, right? It, was, it wasn't like a concern that I'm gonna hack the grid back then. Back then it was like, I'm gonna hack into the CIA website and start changing things on their website because I thought it was fun, right? So it was a different type of threat. But now you're talking critical infrastructure that is actually, right? So the threat is significantly higher as, as technology gets more and more advanced where, you know, you have countries that are saying, right, this is from Germany, all critical infrastructure would be affected and it would be almost impossible to prevent the collapse of society um, as a whole. I'm, I'm not that nihilistic where I'm not, you know, I, I believe that we're, we're going to overcome this one way or another. I think there's, there's always big challenges in, in life, but you just have to pay attention to it and, and, and recognize the threats and, and try to find solutions to address these threats. And coming back to, to the military, um, there's a nice book uh, downstairs. It was like uh, threats uh, to, uh, uh, like they were giving it away. To, uh, to maritime environment, like cyber threats to, to yep, that one exactly, um, which, is, which is so significantly true. I mean, I'm not saying here that the U.S. warships that collided like a few months apart, like three of them in the Pacific was the result of a cyber attack. But knowing how the navigational systems work, right, they could have easily been the victims of a cyber attack. And if not them, like if they, if they uh, uh, hit another vessel, it could have been easily where that other vessel could have been hacked, where it changed the direction of the vessel radically and, and hit one of the, the U.S. vessels. Right? So, so this is not official, right, uh, uh, DOD. Uh, I'm just kind of doing hypotheticals here. Right? So by what means to protect... Um, the biggest one is that I've seen that, that really works is policy. So policy changes has really helped U.S. Uh, do significant improvements on how they secure their, their critical infrastructure. Um, and they can also uh, better regulate uh, that relationship between the Department of Defense or the cyber, the, uh, the state infrastructure or, or the federal infrastructure that are, that are responsible for cybersecurity um, to better collaborate with the private sector. And in the U.S. you see that a lot. Uh, in Europe not so much and it's, it's still a working process. Uh, and another working process here is uh, because I look at the NATO uh, level, so I'm at the NATO Defense College, uh, my biggest challenge is really trust between allies. So which I was guilty coming from the U.S. side in the past where, oh, I'm not going to trust this country or that country or, right, you just kind of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to classify my report as no foreign because I don't want anybody else to read it. But does it really need to be no foreign? No foreign is basically the classification where it's not for foreign uh, personnel, 
not everything has to be no form, but we, we've been educated over the years to just put everything with like, we're not gonna share this. And once it's classified no form, you can share it with an ally, which means they can't necessarily protect themselves against a threat that it shouldn't, I mean, it shouldn't have been a problem sharing that information with them. Right. So, is the green military uh, a solution? I, I still believe that, uh, Right, it is. I mean, even though we've moved away from, from the concept, I think we're going to come back to it once new technologies are going to come out. So I haven't, uh, uh, I don't believe that just because uh, the Department of Defense doesn't focus so much on, on pushing sustainability first, it doesn't mean that it's not important. It's important as you, as you if you match it with other uh, priorities that the Department of Defense uh, has. Otherwise, they would, if, if they didn't care, they would have shut down the whole program too. So, um, and this is another uh, way to fix the problem is new technologies. This is a picture from the uh, nuclear uh, fusion uh, patent that was uh, uh, recently filed by uh, the Department of the Navy. Um, I'm not necessarily promoting uh, fusion or fission or saying that uh, nuclear is part of sustainability, but it could be. Uh, so depending of how, because fusion and fission, they're two different, uh, two different things. And this may, uh, this may reinvigorate a lot of the different programs like the, uh, because this is in a compact uh, area where you actually have ships uh, being run uh, by uh, nuclear fusion technologies. So, right. Is defense enough? This is kind of uh, on the cybersecurity side, um, we don't just look at a right, passive defense you also have to take things into offensive. You have to be proactive, and we're going to see a lot more of this uh, over the years, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, uh, where initially it was uh, the U.S. and a couple of countries that were active here. Uh, the rest of Europe was, uh, you know, we're going to be up to here and up to intelligence, uh, but now uh, NATO is moving forward to accepting this as well. And that's, uh, that concludes my presentation. That's what I have. And uh, I'll uh, let you guys take over. So thank you for listening to me. I'm kind of concerned about anything nuclear. I need to edit application to nuclear reactors in the nuclear regulatory and their cavalier questions what we Yeah, so I like to look at, uh, I think this one is, there's a, there's a lot of reports out there. So this, this is usually what gets to policymakers, right? So they have a list of, hey, this is a likelihood and impact, and we're going to put our money where, where based on what the priorities are. And a lot of times, it's like when you're asking, it's like, okay, so who wrote this type of report? Like in this particular case, it was not from the intelligence community, right? So this was uh, like economists or academics and output. So they see, okay, well, the, the impact of, of a, uh, right, the nuclear uh, or like a weapons of mass destruction, if you put, if you put a, an, a cyber attack against a nuclear infrastructure, that would cause a meltdown, for example what you're saying, it would cause an effect, I would say, equivalent to a weapon of mass destruction. We can say that. But then if you look at likelihood, they're saying, oh, the likelihood is like probably all the way down here. So because they're not, they don't look at it in this order, what they look at it is they have like a whole grid. So, and they wanna make sure we're gonna put priority on the, on the things that are on high likelihood and high impact. So because like an attack against the nuclear infrastructure would be, uh, or, or uh, weapons of mass destruction attack would be on the low uh, likelihood side. It's like, okay, well, it's not a priority right now. Let's look at the priority which is higher likelihood for it. But yeah, good question. But if this report was, was, was written by somebody in the Intel community, I'm wondering, would this look different? Thank you.
on that kind of thing now? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's just like, we have like really, really smart people working within DOD. I mean, that's me saying that, which is a lot actually, but uh, it, it's, yeah, I mean, lessons learned is always like important, but not necessarily, I don't think in, I'm, I'm not sure if DOD has done something in particular, like with the three mile, right, so the, or, or, or with the Fukushima, but uh, case, but they're done by, right, academics and so forth, that they're v still very valuable by DOD when they prepare for reacting to certain disasters, uh, events, so, yeah. Um, by green military, do you mean non-digital? Can you define that? Um, I think the, 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 the aspect of green military is where replacement of fuels so like oil and so forth, and now you're having, you're using renewables um, to, uh, to operate uh, aircraft or uh, aircraft carriers and so forth. It's, it's the fuel aspect of it, yes, what, at least from the DOD side, so. Um, a lot of these uh, threats seem to be based on the idea that the, the energy system or whatever system you're looking at is really a centralized system rather than, say, a distributed system. But, um, I mean, if everybody going to ask everybody have a solar panel on top of their house, uh, it would be this massively distributed system would be pretty hard to attack that. Is there anything in the policy sphere that's sort of suggesting this? Is, is the U.S. or do you moving to a more distributed system? Um, I think that's still a work in process, uh, primarily because, I mean, DOD has just over the past few years started to look more into, into critical infrastructure, but there are exercises that we're now at least doing together with the private industry where you have now military and private uh, actually doing exercises and preparing together so that in case of an event, it's the same teams that are actually reacting and they're there. So, but it's, but, uh, yes. Um, and the, the other thing is, is like, uh, for example, on the NATO side, people don't realize that NATO actually has pipelines that they operate. Like, there's an actual NATO pipeline system. Like, one of them is the SEPS system, which almost all the Air, Air Force bases uh, in France, Germany, uh, and three other countries that are connected to this pipeline, they're, they're dependent on it. Not only that, the national airports are also getting their their fuels uh, from the same from the same systems. So, but the protection of the system within each country is the country that's responsible for protection of the system. So now you have France and Germany that uh, hire pri uh, private companies that they just protect the infrastructure within their own uh, country. But then when you're talking, it's like, okay, so do you talk to this company to share information? Oh no, we don't share that because they're also competitors. So, so now you have two private companies, right, the French and the German one, that are competitors, they refuse to work with each other, but they're responsible for protecting their section of the pipelines. But if they know about a vulnerability here that can affect the pipeline, but they're refusing to share that vulnerability with uh, like the French, with the German uh, side, how much sense does it make? Because if the German side gets attacked because of this vulnerability, it will also affect the French system. So th th there's, uh, there's something to be said about bureaucracy and, and trying to get people to work together. And right, They look at it, this is a centralized system, but they look at it from a decentralized eye, not realizing that they have to cooperate together too. So yeah, so yeah, that's a good question, thank you. So, but this is a challenge that I mean, uh, that I'm, dealing with and trying to right, even bring it on the environmental side. Uh, for my, I'm doing my, my uh, dissertation in the Department of Environmental Sciences. And people go like, okay, well, you're talking about energy security with, for NATO. You're talking about cybersecurity for NATO. But why are you in the environmental sciences department? Right? Because a lot of times when, when you talk to a lot of these uh, uh, energy infrastructure owners on the private side, and they go like, well, we don't have to protect this because, well, if we get attacked by a terrorist attack, that's the state's responsibility to protect our infrastructure. Or, oh, we've purchased environmental insurance. 
So, so their cyber, their cyber uh, the, you know, the way that they protect this particular critical infrastructure from a cyber attack is by buying or by purchasing environmental insurance, as in if they get you know, hacked and whatever the cost of it will be is covered by, the, by this environmental insurance, which is actually being sold for cyber attacks, believe it or not. So, yeah. And particularly when you come, when you talk to the environment, and in particular we talk about nuclear meltdown. I mean, how many years does it take to actually for the bio right to to, to clean up completely that uh, that particular uh, environment? So, yeah, good question. <laughs> But I also believe that, I mean, there's a good reason for it, right? There's, there's, there's not a lot of transparency, and people complain that, okay, well, there's not a lot of transparency in the energy field. There's a reason. When you have certain systems that take 10 years to fix, you don't want everybody to know those vulnerabilities, and now you're, you're encouraging uh, a lot of different actors to come in and, and attack those, right? So, uh, yeah. Do you know if there are any projects to develop AI methods for preventing this kind of cyber attack? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I had a slide here. I took it out, actually, um, because I didn't want to move, because I, I can move into all these different directions, and I had to, to focus. But yeah, uh, artificial intelligence is, is huge, and I had one uh, with a quote from the president, uh, and he's got like uh, one, he's tech technology advisor over there that, f that focuses very much on, uh, on artificial intelligence uh, and how artificial intelligence can be used to identify those vulnerabilities, but also to identify ways to, to, to react to these vulnerabilities. So. There are other techniques, for example, AI could validate all commands and basically say, if this thing is so out of the ordinary, I'm not going to execute it, but I'm going to contact someone else before I do it. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's so many different ways. We get, the, the reality is that we have very limited operators out there, whether, it's, whether they're on the civilian side or, or the DOD side. And we absolutely need artificial intelligence to identify a lot of these flags so that we can filter through a lot of these threats that, that a lot of these critical infrastructures are getting every single day. So, and most of them go uh, uh, like without, like without being noticed. So, yeah, artificial intelligence is critical, I think, in, in us moving forward and, and protecting uh, this critical infrastructure. Okay, thank you again, so.